Hi everyone, in this video we'll be discussing how to use integration to find areas of regions in the plane. Uh, in particular, we'll use algebraic skills and technology to help us visualize uh, different types of regions in the plane. We'll employ our various techniques of integration to find the areas of those regions. And we'll also use geometric principles to help us derive integral identities and simplify integrals. All right, so to start, let's think about one particular problem in a couple of different ways. So imagine you're asked to find the area in the xy plane that's bounded by the curves y is equal to x squared and y is equal to the square root of x. Now, without any technology, we can sort of use uh, what we know algebraically about these functions, right? So if I think about these, these two functions, so square root of x looks something like this. Um, I'm obviously not an artist, which is why we're going to use Desmos to help us quite a bit. Let's first think about doing one of these by hand. Uh, and then we have y is equal to the square root of x. That looks something like this. Okay. And so if we're trying to find the area um, in this region, we're sort of trying to, are bounded by these two curves, we're really looking for the area of this region. Now, obviously, this is not some nicely... Um, some nice polygon or something that we have some nice formula for finding the area of. So uh, we're going to need to use uh, something, some other tools uh, to help us here. Um, now, again, as I sort of mentioned, you know, we're, we're going to need to know some important things about this. Like we might need to know where these two curves intersect. Okay. Um, now, I think we sort of know that down here, this point is zero, zero, right? And they certainly both pass through zero, zero. Um, you may be able to just sort of guess where this point is. Um, but let me point out that if you algebraically wanted to, to know what this point was, right, um, you would just say, okay, I've got y is equal to x squared, and I've got y is equal to square root of x. So since these are both equal to y, let me set them equal to each other. And now if I wanted to solve this, what I could do is, is square both sides. Um, so if I square that, that would give me x to the fourth. Square that, that would give me x. Give me x to the fourth minus x is equal to uh, zero. Uh, I can factor an x here. That'll leave me with an x cubed minus one. Okay, so I can already see x is equal to zero is a solution where they, they intersect. Okay, um, I can actually factor this x cubed minus one as a difference of cubes. Um, so that factors as x minus 1 times uh, x squared uh, plus x uh, plus 1. Okay. Now this doesn't factor any further and doesn't have any real roots, so you get your only solutions are when x is equal to 0 and when x minus 1 is equal to 0, or when x is equal to 1, okay? So this other point happens when x is 1. Y, when x is 1, if I plug x is equal to 1 into either of these, right, I'll get 1 back out, okay? So this point is 1, 1, right? As you can see, even for this fairly simple one, right, there's quite a bit of work if we really want to algebraically understand exactly where this region is. Um, and it, we can do it, but it just requires some work. Um, but what we might want to do is, is sort of leverage something like Desmos uh, to help us visualize these regions. Okay, So um, I'm actually going to be showing um, a number of illustrations from Desmos today. Um, so you're welcome to use Desmos to help you visualize these regions, um, both on the homeworks and the quizzes. Uh, and on tests, if I ask you to do something like this, I will provide you with uh, a plot of the region uh, so that you you have that in front of you. Okay. So uh, in particular, uh, if I ask Desmos to plot this, uh, there's a much nicer looking picture of that region than the, the one I drew. Okay. So, so now the question becomes, well, how am I going to find the area of this region? Okay. And so uh, to help with this a bit, uh, let, let's think about this two different ways. So I'm going to start uh, with a method I'm going to call method one. I'm going to blow this up a bit. Um, the fundamental idea just of integration is to try and break this up into simpler shapes, right? So to break this up into rectangles. 
So um, what I'm first going to imagine is I'm going to break it up into a bunch of rectangles that are sort of um, more vertically oriented. So um, I might break this up into a bunch of rectangles uh, that looks like this. Okay. So um, for each of these rectangles, um, in this approximation, at least, you can see I'm sort of using the, the left-hand side of the rectangle is going from the upper function to the lower function, upper function to the lower function, okay? And you can imagine if I took more and more and more rectangles, right, this would become a better and better and better approximation. So really what I'm doing is I'm integrating something. I'm integrating, sort of adding up the area of all these rectangles, so let's think about just one of these rectangles. So let, let's say I selected like this rectangle right here. Okay. And let's break it off to the side here and see what we could say about that rectangle. Okay. So if I, if I bring this rectangle out, um, well, the first thing I want to find is I want to find the area of this rectangle. Now, um, as I think about the area of this rectangle, well, the area of any, any rectangle, I need the air, uh, length of the base and the, the height. Right. So if I think about sort of the, the base here, the bases, as I take more and more, those are the quantities. Those are sort of my little DXs. Right. So I'm going to think of this little skinny part down here. This is really like DX. Right. OK. Because as I take more and more, that's the part that's going to be shrinking to zero. That's my little sort of little piece of the X axis that's forming my base here. And the height of this rectangle, now let's see, the height of this rectangle is going to be the difference between the height here and the height sort of down here, right? Now, the problem is that as I switch rectangles, right, that's going to depend on x. So at some particular, at this particular x value, this upper height is square root of x, and this lower height is uh, x squared. Okay, so it's sort of like upper, the height is going to be value of the upper function minus value of the lower function. Okay. So over here, I'm going to get that my height is going to be square root of x minus x squared. So again, this is like upper minus lower. And again, right, that depends on x. It depends on what x value I'm sitting at, right, what the height of that rectangle is going to be. Over here, closer to the origin, the rectangles are getting shorter. In the middle, the rectangles get a little bigger. And as you get closer to one, the rectangles get shorter again, right? So the height of the rectangle depends on where I'm at horizontally in this region. It depends on my x value. Okay. But so with this, right, I can sort of think of the area of this rectangle as being square root of x minus x squared. That's my height times my base, which is dx. Okay. So now I know for any one of these rectangles, right, I sort of know its, its area, right? I sort of wrote it as if I was doing this one. I was thinking about one arbitrary one. But this works for, for any of these, right? Okay. So now I know the areas of each of these rectangles. Now what I really need to do uh, is add that area up. Okay? And so if I sort of start adding all those areas together, then really what I'm doing to get my total area is I'm integrating square root of x minus x squared dx. Now, what am I integrating from? Well, I'm integrating over all of these x values, and here my x values are starting at zero and going all the way up to one. So I'm going to integrate this from zero to one. Okay. So um, this is easy enough to integrate. So this first term, so I'm just going to take an antiderivative and evaluate at the endpoints. The first term, that's x to the one half. So increase the power by one divide by the new power, okay, so three halves is a new power, divide by three halves, same as multiplying by two thirds, minus, this will be x cubed over three, evaluate at one and zero, and take a difference. And what I'll end up with if I evaluate at one is two thirds minus one third. Evaluating at zero will give me zero. And so I end up with this, oops, you can't see that. So 
this would give me two thirds minus one third evaluating at one minus zero for both of these at zero. And so I get that uh, one third is the area of this region. All right, great. Now, in this case, it is important to note, right, we've been using here uh, these sort of vertically oriented uh, rectangles, right? So my, my bases were dx. They were sort of little skinny pieces of the, the x-axis. I sort of broke up my x-axis and then built these rectangles. Um, and, and doing that, I got an area of one third, okay? But there's no reason that I couldn't turn the rectangles the other way. So let's see what happens if we do that. So what if instead I had taken and I partitioned sort of all the y values from zero up to one, right? And then I broke it up into little rectangles sort of now going horizontally, right? Okay. So, um, well, let's think about, could I find the area of one of those rectangles? And then if so, maybe I could add them all up for my y values going from zero up to one. All right. So uh, let's pick a particular one and let's sort of think about breaking it out here, okay? So uh, if I take this, well, um, now the height of my rectangle, right? It's gonna be, it's, I partitioned the Y values and it's a little piece of Y. So this is like a DY now, okay? Now, um, the, the, the width now is sort of the, the problem that's gonna be a little more interesting, okay? So if I want to think about the width here, now I'm thinking about it as the difference between this upper endpoint and this lower endpoint, okay? If I think about this curve, let's see, this curve in blue here is what? This is y is equal to x squared. But I don't want the y value here, right? What I want here is actually the, the x value, right? Because I'm going to take the x value here minus the x value down here, that's gonna give me the width of that rectangle, okay? So I don't want the y value, I want the x value. So if I solve for x here, I'll get that x is equal to the square root of y, okay? So this upper limit is x is equal to the square root of y. Now, if I look over here, right, and I sort of want this x value, well, this is on the curve, uh, this orange curve, right? And the orange curve is uh, y is equal to square root of x. So, but I don't want the y value, I want the x value now. So if I solve this for x, I'll get x is equal to y squared, okay? And so I get that uh, this lower x value is y squared, right? As I change my y moving up and down, the width of these rectangles changes now right? And the width depends on my y value. So this width now is going to be the upper x value, square root of y, minus the lower x value, y squared. So this width is square root of y minus y squared. And so I get that the area of my rectangle here is the width times the height, okay? or square root of y minus y squared dy. And you may notice that this is actually the same area we got before for the rectangle. Just now this is in terms of y instead of x. That will not always be the case, okay? But it is in this, this example. So now um, let's, let's go back and let's sort of see if we can use this then to again calculate the total area. So if we if we sort of put that piece back, right, and now that we have the area of one rectangle, now we want to add up the areas of all these rectangles, right? And so um, if I, I want to add them all up to get my total area, 
I'm going to just, this integral is going to add all of these up. Square root of y minus y squared dy. And again, we're going to integrate this. Our y values go, in this case, from 0 to 1. So I get this. Now, you'll notice this is exactly the same integral we got when we did method 1, except in this case, we have y's instead of x's, but the variable sort of doesn't matter in, in like what we call it. It's the same integral. And so we'll again get one third. Okay. Now, um, for this problem, it turns out that both ways of doing this, you get a, basically the same integral. doesn't really matter which way you think about it. As we'll see from some examples coming up, though, whether you choose to sort of orient your rectangles vertically or horizontally, uh, can make a very big difference in how uh, how easy it is to find the area of the region. Okay. So let's move on then and look at another example. So imagine that you're asked to find the area between y is equal to sine of x and y is equal to sine of 2x between x is equal to pi over 3 and x is equal to pi. Okay. So uh, if we first uh, take a look at this region, um, the important thing to sort of note here, right, if you were to just graph these functions, right, you notice that there's some area trapped here and also some area trapped over here but you're actually asked to find it between pi over three and pi, right? So you're really only looking for this area over here, okay? This sort of area that's shaded in in pink here, okay? Now, um, I, I wanna point out that um, if we sort of back up for a second, right? Um, if I just sort of think about the graphs of these two functions, um, so you get a so the sine of x and then uh, sine of 2x. Uh, sorry. This is why I have, uh, why I like having Desmos around. Yeah. That's not very good, but you get the idea. Um, you could wonder now, should I slice this horizontally or vertically, okay? And again, my picture, not making this super obvious, so let's sort of draw it like that a little more. Okay, now if you were to slice horizontally, the problem you'd run into is up here, the length of these slices would be the difference between two different points on this same curve. Then as you came down here, your width of your rectangle would be determined by the difference between the x values on these two different curves. And then when you got down here, the width of your rectangles would be determined by the difference between these two x values on the same curve again. So you would have to switch constantly what functions you were using to give you your upper and lower uh, x values that determine the width of that rectangle. Okay. However, if we slice vertically, right, we have a consistent function, which is always on the top. That is the uh, sine of x function. And a consistent function that's always on the bottom, which is the sine of 2x function in this region. Okay, So in this case, it's actually better to slice vertically because it gives you a consistent uh, top and bottom function. If you slice horizontally, you don't get a consistent sort of upper and lower function. All right. And so again, maybe this illustrates it slightly better, right? But if you imagine sort of, uh, you know, you're trying to take a, a horizontal slice, uh, you're, you're here, your upper and lower are going to be on the same function, just two different x values there. But then when you come down here, right, your upper and lower are going to be different functions. And when you get down here, they're going to be back to the same function again, but a different same function than they were up here. So you have to do lots of switching back and forth. Whereas if we slice horizontal, or sorry, slice vertically, right, we get a consistent, the blue function is always on top and the uh, orange function is always on the bottom. All right. So again, let's sort of think about selecting an arbitrary rectangle here. 
Okay. And let's think about what the area of this rectangle would be. I'll sort of write this over here. The area of my rectangle, well, certainly the base uh, will be a little slice of in the x direction. So that's going to be a dx. And now the height is going to be the difference between these two functions, right? So the upper function, the y value up here, uh, this upper function is uh, sine of x. Okay. The lower function here is sine of 2x. Okay. And so the height then will be the difference between that upper function sine of x and the lower function sine of 2x. And so then the area of my rectangle, right, is going to be uh, sine of x minus sine of 2x, go up a little bit, minus sine of 2x dx. And so now, oh, let me actually just move that rectangle out of the way. Okay. And so now if I want to find the total area, I need to integrate that. So my total area will be the integral of sine of x minus sine of 2x dx. Now let's see, my region, my x values go from pi over 3 up to pi. So this is going to be from pi over 3 up to pi. All right, so what do I do? I take an antiderivative. Antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine x. Antiderivative, I get a minus. Antiderivative of sine of 2x will be 1 half negative, so make that a plus, cosine of 2x. And I'm going to evaluate that at pi and at pi over 3, and I'm going to take a difference. Okay. So now we evaluate at our endpoints. When I plug in pi here, I get minus cosine of pi is negative 1, plus 1 half times cosine of 2 pi. That's just 1. Minus, now I evaluate at pi over 3. So I get minus cosine of pi over 3. That's minus 1 half and then plus one half times cosine of two times pi over three. Cosine of two pi over three is minus one half. Okay. And so let's see, what do I end up with? I end up with, this is one plus one half, that's three halves minus, here I end up with negative a half plus negative a fourth. So let's see, negative a half plus negative a fourth is negative three fourths. So this is six fourths plus three fourths, which ends up with nine fourths. And so the area of this region over here is exactly nine fourths. All right. Now, again, in this case, we wanted to make horizontal slices. Uh, or sorry, we wanted to make vertical slices, horizontal slices um, didn't seem very good. Let's actually look at another example where the opposite is true. Now imagine you're asked to find the area between these two curves. Now you might say these, these aren't, or you might notice these aren't normally, um, these aren't expressed with y as a function of x the way we are normally maybe used to sort of seeing functions. Um, you could do that down here, but in this case, uh, this equation is does not express y as a function of x. Um, nevertheless, you can actually plug these directly into Desmos and it'll give you a plot of these curves. So um, this curve uh, in orange here, um, this is the uh, x is equal to y squared minus 2y. Uh, this maybe it's not so, or it's a little easier to see that this is uh, the line here. Okay. Um, but nevertheless, um, I, I now want to find the area of this sort of 
uh, shape here, right? Um, so let's see if we can find this. Now, again, uh, you could sort of imagine, okay, um, I could either sort of slice this horizontally or vertically. If I were to slice it vertically, right, the problem I'd run into is when I slice here, right, my upper minus my lower, right, would be the difference between the Y value of the orange curve and the Y value of the blue curve. But when I slice over here, I would get that the height is the difference between the upper Y value of the orange curve and the lower Y value of the orange curve. Now, there's nothing to stop me. I, I could actually do that. OK, so uh, if I were to do that, what I'd have to do is I'd actually need to break this region up into sort of two different regions. And I would break it at this point where the upper, where what constitutes the lower piece would switch. Right. So I would do one integral to calculate this area over here and another integral to calculate this area over here. However, that's unnecessary because if I'm willing to make uh, horizontal slices, right, then I have a consistent upper and lower, right? If I just sort of, if you think about sort of, just, I'm not even going to make the whole slice, I'm just going to draw lines, right? If I do this, I sort of consistently have the blue always gives me my upper X value and the orange always gives me my lower X value, all right? So um, let's imagine sort of slicing it up in that way, right? So I take and I make a bunch of slices here um, that, are, that are now horizontal slices and I want to use those to help me find the area of the curve, or sorry, the area of the region bounded between these curves. All right, pick one of the rectangles, okay, and let's break it out, okay. All right, so um, I'm doing horizontal slices. That means my slices now, their heights are little pieces of sort of the y-axis, so my height is going to be dy, okay. And now I need my width. And this is where I have to do a little work, right? If I come back over here to my picture, my width is sort of this X value. Well, let's see, what's that X value? This curve came from X minus Y minus four is equal to zero. And I want to know the X value. So if I solve that for X, that gives me X is equal to Y plus four. So this X value is Y plus four, okay? What's this lower X value? Okay. Well, this is came from the curve, x is equal to y squared minus 2y, right? So here, there's actually, because I'm using this expression, there's I don't need to solve for x. It's already solved for x. So this is my y value here. So my width here of this rectangle will be the difference between the upper x value and the lower x value. And so it will be uh, y plus 4 minus y squared minus 2y, okay? Now, I can simplify that a bit, right? So I have, excuse me, a minus y squared, I have a y minus a negative 2y, so that's y plus 2y, so that's 3y, and then a plus 4, okay? And so the area of my rectangle, a little too high there, the area of my rectangle is minus y squared plus 3y plus 4 dy. All right. Now, if I just move this rectangle back out of my way, I ought to be able to now add up uh, all of these values. All right. So I, I want to add them all up to get my total area. So that will be the integral of minus y squared plus 3y plus 4 dy. Now, um, in this case, I, I need to know, though, what the y values range from, right? I need to know what this lower y value is and what this upper y value is. Okay. Now, in order to figure that out, I'm, I might need to do a little bit of algebra. Now, if you're in Desmos, right, or you can maybe actually sort of see here, it looks like this value is at about negative one. It looks like this value is sitting up here at four. Okay. But let's say you, you didn't have that. How would you figure it out? Well, 
you already have this solved for X, right? And we solved this for X a minute ago. So what you could do is find where X is equal to Y squared minus 2Y and X is equal to Y plus 4. You want to know where they intersect. And so you set Y squared minus 2Y equal to Y plus 4. Now this gives you y squared minus 3y minus 4 is equal to 0. This factors. This factors as y minus 4 times y plus 1. And you can now see that you get solutions here when y is equal to 4 and y is equal to negative 1. And so, in fact, our y values where we intersect are negative 4, or sorry, are negative 1 and positive four, okay? So we'll integrate from negative one to positive four. All right, so now doing that, okay, I take an antiderivative here. So this will be minus y cubed over three uh, plus three y squared over two plus four y. And I'm going to evaluate at 4 and negative 1 and take a difference. And so if I evaluate at 4, uh, this would give me minus 64 over 3 plus uh, 16 times 3 is 48 over 2 plus 16 minus Evaluating this at negative one will give me uh, positive one third plus three halves plus four. And uh, this is where actually uh, one of the reasons I want to give you this is I wanted to sort of make a point. If you're asked to do written work uh, in this course, it's perfectly acceptable to leave your answer like this. Of course, uh, or, or at least to write this out, right? You may want to simplify it, right? And if you're writing a report to somebody, right, you would want to simplify this. Um, but this actually makes it really easy for me to see your thought process. And if you don't need to do anything else, um, this is actually a really nice way to see it. Um, then if you want to get it in a simplified form, right, um, we can certainly do that. The problem is going to be to do that by hand. We need to get a common denominator of six. Um, it's just going to get sort of algebraically tedious, um, and so we can just leave our final answer here in this form. All right, so now that we've seen a couple of examples, um, I want you to think about writing two different integrals, each of which represent the area of the region bounded between the curves y is equal to natural log of x and y is equal to the natural log of x squared. Okay. You may wish, and I would, in fact, I would encourage you to use something like a graphing calculator or Desmos to help you visualize this region. And then I essentially want you to write the two different integrals, one by slicing horizontally and the other by slicing vertically. I'm going to pause the video and let you give that a try. Okay, great. Let's take a look at the graph of these two functions. So graphing these two functions, we see in blue here, we have natural log of x. Uh, in orange, we have natural log of x squared. And what we're aiming to find is the area of this little region sitting in between them. Okay. Now, notice here that if we slice horizontally or vertically, we'll be fine either way because we'll have a consistent top and bottom function either way we slice. Okay, So um, if I were to slice horizontally, or sorry, let's uh, start with vertically. If I were to make vertical slices, okay, let's see, what would happen? Well, then the height would just be upper function minus lower function. So I would get uh, ln of x minus ln of x, oops, minus ln of x quantity squared dx. And those x values would range from uh, one 
up to E. So E is where these two things intersect, right? So if you look at uh, where natural log of X is equal to natural log of X squared, uh, that happens at one. At one, both of these are zero. Uh, it also happens at E, because at E, natural log of E is one, and one is equal to one squared, okay? So uh, this would be your answer if you were to slice it vertically. If you were to make horizontal slices, then the first thing you have to do is convert these functions into functions of uh, y. So if I were to slice these uh, horizontally, then this function, which was uh, y is equal to natural log of x, I would exponentiate both sides, and I would get that x is equal to e to the y. So I would want to think about this lower function, because I'm slicing horizontally now. So the lower x value is e to the y. The upper one, right, this was uh, y is equal to natural log of x quantity squared. But now I'm going to take a square root, and then I'm going to exponentiate. And I would get x is equal to e to the square root y. So this x value here would be e to the square root y. And so now the width of one of these horizontal slices would be e to the square root y minus e to the y. Now, what am I going to integrate? Oh, sorry, dy. Okay. Now, what am I going to integrate from? I'm integrating y values now. So my y values start at 0, and they go up to 1. Now, the nice thing here is both of these integrals represent the same area. So whichever one you choose, their values have to be equal to one another. Okay. Now, uh, when you look at and think about integrating one of these, um, I actually think the uh, neither of these look particularly nice. The e to the y doesn't look bad here, but this e to the square root y, I'm not exactly sure what I would do with that. Um, if I look at um, if I look at this, uh, I don't love natural log of x, but we've actually seen how to do integration by parts uh, with that before. So let's actually think about trying to evaluate this first uh, first integral. Okay. So uh, if I were just to try and find an antiderivative of natural log of x minus natural log of x squared, well, I can do this piece by piece. And we've already actually calculated the antiderivative of natural log of x. We, you do that by parts. Uh, it gives you x natural log of x minus x. Okay. But now I need to subtract this integral of natural log of x squared. Okay. I'm actually going to find this integral by parts. Okay, so let me uh, come over here. And uh, if I want to do the integral of natural log of x squared dx. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let my u be natural log of x squared because I can differentiate that. And so my u prime is going to be uh, 2 natural log of x times the derivative of natural log of x, which is 1 over x. And now my v prime is going to be 1. And so my v will just be x. And so the integration by parts formula then will give me that this is x natural log of x squared. So u times v minus the integral of u prime v. Now notice when I multiply these two together, the x and the 1 over x right, we'll multiply to 1, and so what I'll be left with is a 2 natural log of x dx. But notice I actually already know this, right, so this gives me x natural log of x squared minus 2 times the antiderivative of natural log of x is x ln x minus x, and so this ends up being x natural log of x squared minus 2x natural log of x plus 2x. Now, that needs to be substituted back in up here. 
And so we get that this entire antiderivative is x natural log of x minus x minus x natural log of x squared minus 2x ln x uh, plus 2x. Okay. Now, racing this piece down here. If I simplify this a bit, right, let's see, I've got, uh, let's see, I'm going to do this sort of with powers of ln x. So I get a minus x natural log of x squared. Then I get, uh, I have this x ln x and a minus negative 2x ln x. So I think I'm going to get a plus 3x ln x. And then I have a minus x minus a 2x. I'm going to get a minus 3x. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, I have constant of integration on all these. Okay. But now to evaluate this uh, definite integral, right, I just need an antiderivative. So I can take c is equal to 0. Okay. And so now if I want this from uh, 1 to e, right, I'm just going to evaluate this piece right at 1 and e and take a difference. All right, now let's see what happens then. So if I evaluate at e, well, ln of e is 1, okay? So if I evaluate at e, I'm going to get minus e plus 3e minus 3e. Okay, so that's evaluating at E minus, if I evaluate at one, oh, wait, sorry, I did those in the wrong order. Wait, no, sorry, I just wrote them in the wrong order here, sorry. So upper limit of integration minus at the lower limit of integration, well, ln of one is zero, okay? So that's going to be zero, zero, and then just a minus three. And so what I end up with is a minus e, a plus 3e minus 3e, and then a minus negative 3. I end up with 3 minus e as the area of this region over here. Okay. Now, it's worth noting that because you now know that this is equal to 3 minus e, you actually know that that other integral, that integral from 0 to 1 of e to the square root y minus e to the y, um, dy, you actually also know that that has to be equal to this value because both of these integrals represent the area of the same region. Now, it turns out that that's actually a really powerful idea sometimes for helping us integrate uh, functions that can look sort of impossible to deal with at first. All right, so let's look at one last example. So now let's say you were asked to find the integral from one to four of secant inverse of square root of x. Now on the surface, this has nothing to do with area of a region, um, but I also have no idea, if I wanna use the fundamental theorem of calculus directly on this problem, I have no idea how to find an antiderivative of secant inverse of square root of x. The one thing I might try is uh, an integration by parts where I let this be my u, let my v prime be one, and, and I could see if that works out. But I wanna actually see that there's a really clever way to do this if we think about this as representing the area of a region, okay? So uh, if I were to plot uh, this function secant inverse, and I, I'm just gonna sketch a quick graph over here because we don't need anything really exact. Um, if you were to plot this, um, you would see that the graph sort of looks like this. Okay, so this value is one, okay? And so you can imagine, you know, if you go up to four, right, the integral from one to four of this would be something that looks like this. And again, this, this function I plotted here is secant inverse of square root of x. All right, but again, I don't know how to calculate that directly. This setup though, right, it's a dx setup, it's really thinking about taking vertical slices of this region, right? But what if instead I thought about taking horizontal slices? 
Now, if I think about taking horizontal slices, what happens? Well, now my upper X value is just this constant four, but what is this lower value? So if I think about this function, uh, I have y is equal to secant inverse of square root of x. If I solve that for y, let's see what happens. I'll take secant of both sides. So I get secant of y is equal to square root of x. And I'll square both sides. So I'll get secant squared of y is equal to x. So this curve can also be described as x is equal to secant squared y. So if I take horizontal slices, the width of these, the upper x value will be 4, the lower will be secant squared of y. So I can rewrite the integral as the integral of 4 minus secant squared y dy, where my y values now, let's see, they're going to range from, well, 0 up to this y value. Well, what is this y value? That's what I would get if I plugged 4 into this expression here. So if I plug 4 in here, I'll get square root of 4 is 2. I'll get secant inverse of 2. Okay. Now, why is this a better integral to deal with? Well, now let's, let's actually calculate this. So the antiderivative of this, well, antiderivative of 4 would be 4y. The antiderivative of secant squared, well, secant squared is the derivative of tangent. So the antiderivative, this is just tangent of y, and it's going to be evaluated at secant inverse of 2 uh, oh, uh, and 0. And so now, well, if I evaluate these both at secant inverse of 2, this will give me 4 times secant inverse of 2 minus tangent of secant inverse of 2 minus, if I evaluate at 0, both of these are 0 when y is 0. Okay. So I get 4 secant inverse of 2 minus tangent of secant inverse of 2, but you can actually simplify this using a reference triangle. So if you imagine that your angle theta is secant inverse of 2, what that's really saying is secant of theta is equal to 2. Okay, keep in mind that secant of theta is hypotenuse over adjacent. Okay. If I take my hypotenuse to be 2 and my adjacent side to be 1, then this side will, by the Pythagorean theorem, be the square root of 3. And now what I want is tangent of that theta value. I want tangent of secant inverse of 2. And so tangent of theta will be opposite over adjacent. It'll just be square root of 3. And so this value is just square root of 3. And now I have the value of this integral because I took this integral. I thought of it as the area of some region in the plane. I re-expressed the area of that region in the plane in sort of by swapping the order of slicing. And then that gave me an integral I was able to more directly evaluate. And so now this value must be equal to the original value of the integral up here. Right? This is very tricky and it's not always guaranteed to work, but in some cases it's a really helpful method for calculating the values of definite integrals. Okay. So we're going to stop there for this video. You'll have opportunities in the homework and quiz to practice these as well as in a written assignment. Uh, as always, if you have questions, I do encourage you to reach out. Uh, I'm happy to uh, either talk via email, or just via email and respond to questions if that's easiest. Or if you would prefer, we can always set up a time uh, to sit down and talk uh, more in depth about any questions you may have about this material or any issues that may arise in completion of the homework, quiz, or written assignment.